Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome today Laszlo Erdős from IST, IST Vienna. And he changed his title compared to what was announced on the website. It will talk about quantum unique agrodicity or thermal ETH for Wigner matrices. And I recall that uh, it's possible to ask questions during the talk. It's better to use the microphone. OK. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's very nice to be here. Um, I changed my title mainly because I realized that it would fit very well after Malini's lecture. So you will see some of the same concepts here, uh, quantum unique ergodicity and things like that in a somewhat different context. It's not in, the, in this very geometric context, it's in a random matrix context, but basic ideas will be, will be quite similar. And as I said, I mean, as Malini said, feel free to ask stop me and ask, ask any questions. I don't exactly know the audience. I was told that some of you are physicists and, and anyway. OK, so most of these work are joined with my former student and postdoc, Giorgio Cipollini and, and Dominic Schroeder. So let me just first flash up a few pictures. So that I'm pretty sure that Nalini showed you some of these pictures before, so I will do it very, very quickly. Uh, this is some, some very basic idea about quantization of classical dynamical systems, which of course amounts to changing the momentum observable, the classically called P in classical mechanics, ch change it to the, to the usual momentum operator minus I times Laplacian in the quantum setup. And then what happens is that there, is a, there are basically two types of systems. There are regular systems, integrable systems, on one side, this is what happens here. On the other side, there are chaotic systems. Of course, there are many things in between, but I'll just focus on these two situations. So on the top, you see two very typical classical systems. One of them is the regular uh, integrable billiard, just the usual two-dimensional billiard table, um, a disk and inside of the disk. And the trajectories obviously have some nice regularity, in particular, their first integrals. The, the one, fir one first integral is the angle here, the, the angle of incidence that keeps, keeps constant along the motion. On the other hand, if you change the billiard table from something very regular, a little bit less regular, like this cardioid, I think that's the name, then immediately the trajectory becomes very, very uh, chaotic. So that's the situation here. Okay? And now you quantize this system. So quantization in that case here, even there is no potential. The quantization here just means that you look at the Laplacian, so the original kinetic energy would be P square. The P square is changed to the minus Laplacian. Maybe there is this Planck constant as well. And then you look at the eigenfunctions of this corresponding operator. So here, are, here is how the eigenfunctions look like of, of the Laplacian on the, on the disk. This is, what you see here is one very high energy eigenfunction more precisely is the psi square, the level sets of the, of the modulus of the eigenfunction. And you see very nice regularity, uh, this, this rotational symmetry. On the other hand, in the chaotic system, the corresponding eigenfunction is very chaotic. So this is the, the situation. And of course, what one expects is that once the classical, the, the, the chaoticity of the regularity or chaoticity of the classical system, uh, that determines uh, also the corresponding picture in the, in the quantum system, whether you see chaotic wave functions or whether you see some kind of regular, some symmetric wave functions, some more organized things. Okay, so now here is the, the most prominent example, which was just presented an hour ago. Uh, when you take the Laplace Beltrami operator on a surface, where the geodesic flow uh, is, is, is ergodic. For example, you take a, a surface with negative, constant negative curvature. For simplicity, when you can take a compact surface. And then the Laplace Beltrami operator is the usual kinetic energy on that surface. And then you look at the, this is a non negative operator, so it has, it, it, it's a compact operator, it, it's, a, it's resolvent compact, so the spectrum is discrete. So psi i's are the eigen, eigenfunctions. I is referring to the, the, the increasing index. So there is a corresponding eigenvalue, which is increasing, and I label the eigenvectors according to that. And then you ask the following question. You take a, an, an, an arbitrary observable, A, which can be uh, from, from a certain class of uh, operators. In this case, usually, and that was also in Alinis talk, it's some kind of appropriate pseudo-differential operator. But if you don't know what pseudo-differential operators, you cannot think about a usual operator in, in position space, even a function, an x, a function on x, or a function in the momentum space. 
Um, and then, the, and then you, you, you take this quadratic form. So the quadratic form is, of course, very important because these are the measurable object physics. Quantum physics is never about a single wave function. You cannot measure a single wave function. You can measure only quadratic forms of wave functions. You can measure only, actually, you can usually measure only diagonal, uh, uh, diagonal quadratic forms of psi i, a psi i. And then you would like to see what, how it behaves, especially how it behaves as the energy goes to infinity. So in that case, the index and the energy going to infinity is the same. And then the basic, the basic ansatz, basic conjecture, basic statement of quantum unicergadicity is that under this uh, classical chaoticity condition that the geodesic flow is ergodic, we have also a quantum ergodicity, which means that these quadratic forms converge to, first of all, it, it, there is a delta function, so that this, if i is not j, then this quadratic form becomes essentially zero. And then, and then when i is equal to j, then it, it, it tends to a deterministic constant, which is just the symbol of the, op of the observable integrated on the, on the unit cotangent bundle. OK, so that's sort of the, the, the dream type of result, and we have seen that before uh, as well. Now, uh, the, the key point here is that uh, such statement has been typically proven, and that was the original thing, the Schneiderman theorem, and later and there were more generalizations of that by Zeldich and Kolander were there. Uh, these were proven typically for most index pairs. There's a difference between, here I didn't, didn't stress it, but the original ansatz would be that this should hold for any i and j as i and j goes to infinity without any exceptions. But then typically what one can prove is that it's true for most index pairs. So maybe there is a, there is a 1%, a, a, a small percentage of the indices for which this is not true. And the reason why, why usually one does it in that way is that in the typical proofs do not exactly focus on individual indices. They usually focus on some averages, some local averages in the energy space. And the local averages go where it should, should, where it should go. And if the, lo if the local average of such thing go where it should go, then, 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 the, then the indices for which it may deviate from where it should go has only a small percentage. That's roughly the idea how how you prove things like that. But then such a proof, because there's an energy, in this, uh, energy, energy averaging behind that, typically works for most index pairs and not for all index pairs. Now, uh, these were all continuous models, and a very famous result, uh, a, discrete, uh, a discrete version of that, which was on large regular graphs. Again, there is a concept of Laplacian that, that was actually done by Narini many years later. Now, so these were about quantum ergodicity. And now the quantum unique ergodicity, the word unique refers to the fact that you, you want to do it for all indices. That's the dream, and it may, not, may or may not be true. So this was, as, as was mentioned just half an hour ago, this was put on the table by Rudnik and Sarnak from mathematics side, but of course there were physicists behind that as well. Now, whether this is true or not, that's, that's another, another question, but um, there are some counter examples. But typically, you expect that it holds for all indices. Actually, the physicists go, go, go well beyond that. The physics prediction, these are now physicists who, who worked on that on various levels of rigor. Uh, they, even, uh, they even ask about the variance of this quantity. Uh, you know, I mean, if something converges to a determined, uh, this is almost like a random variable. You think of it as a random object. Uh, it converges to a deterministic thing, then this is like a law of large number theorem. That's the first type of question, what you ask about such a system. And then the second question would be that, okay, if you have a law of large number, something, something chaotic converges to something deterministic, what is the variance? What is the speed of convergence? Uh, or in other words, what is the variance? And there's a very precise uh, physics prediction for that, namely that the variance of such, a, such an object here is something which is, uh, which is comparable, or roughly, of the same size as the local eigenvalue spacing. So you have the Laplacian as eigenvalues going out to infinity. Um, and then you look at the eigenvalue spacing, and that, that, that determines the, the variance, and times the, the, the symbol of the A-square operator. So this is just a, just a very vague uh, prediction. Now, this is what has been known in the general setup. This, is a, this was an appetizer. And now let me go to the Wigner matrices, because what we are going to do is that we, we sort of uh, prove this kind of, uh, investigate these kind of questions, but not for the Laplace Beltrami operator. That's actually very hard. That's a much harder question. We investigate it for the simplest possible 
chaotic quantum system, and that's the Wigner matrices, the random matrices. You know, Eugene Wigner had this, this very, very big vision uh, in the 50s, uh, saying that large, the energy levels, it was only about eigenvalues, not about eigenfunctions, but the energy levels, eigenvalues of a large quantum system can be modeled by the eigenvalues of a large random matrix. This was a completely crazy idea, namely that you take, actually it was done for, the, for, for heavy nuclei, in the 50s, and in the 50s there was no standard model yet. Nobody knew the precise Hamiltonian of a heavy nuclei, but there were measurement data. One saw the, the eigen, one saw various statistics of the eigenvalues, and Wigner had decided that these statistics can be modeled, can be mimicked by a completely different system, namely by, a, by the eigenvalues of a, of a random matrix. So basically replacing the actual Hamiltonian by a random matrix. Okay, so that, that, that led to a huge de development on, uh, on, on random matrix theory. So here's just for definiteness, that's the definition of the random matrix. So n is a big parameter, everything is, is finite here. Take an n by n uh, random matrix, it's Hermitian, because we think of it as modeling a Hamiltonian. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the condition is that the entries have to be independent, identical, distributed, of course, up to the Hermitian symmetry, so Hermitian matrix. Uh, symmetric to the diagonal, but apart from that, the matrix elements are symmetric, are, are identical, distributed, independent, and we fix a certain normalization expectation, zero variance to be one over n. Uh, the variance is chosen in such a way here that you have the famous semicircle law. So in other words, under this condition, under this, this normalization, if you picture the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are, of course, on the real line, then what you find is that the eigenvalues uh, as n goes to infinity, the eigenvalues themselves are more, of, more and more of them, but they all essentially confine in the same interval, minus 2, 2. So the matrix, the size of the matrix, uh, the norm of the matrix doesn't grow with n. That's what the normalization does. And moreover, you have the famous Wigner semicircle O, which says that the density of the eigenvalues converges as n goes to infinity to some very, very nice, very definite universal density. So this is what this is what this is the first type of statement, what you basic statement about random matrices, which was done by Wigner. The second statement is much more interesting. This is, if you wish, this is some kind of macroscopic result. If you look at the eigenvalues far away, just want to know the one-point function of the eigenvalues on the macroscopic on the large scale. But the much more interesting is the second question, second picture. Here, Wigner was asking the following thing: look at the so-called gap distribution. The gaps are the differences of the consecutive eigenvalues. The two, eigen, two neighboring eigenvalues have typical distance 1 over n, so in order to get something meaningful, the lambda i plus 1 minus lambda i has to be multiplied by n to, to make it an order 1 object, and actually also multiplied by the local density. It turns out that that's the, that's the right quantity to look at. So this is a gap distribution. Remember, a gap is very important in physics because the gaps determine uh, quantum transitions, eigenvalue gaps are the more, actually eigenvalue gaps are more important than eigenvalues themselves. And then what Wigner figured out, what, what he conjectured, is that the statistics of this gap distribution, so means statistics here means um, either, either you take an, uh, an ensemble average or you can just take one fixed random matrix, one copy of the random matrix, but then sample in the spectrum, so run the index i and then look at various gaps. And then here you see the histogram of such a thing, and then, the, and then Wigner's prediction was that this is always the same curve. So the, the histogram, the density of the distribution of the uh, gaps is always the same, no matter where you do this, I and mean, you can do it here, you can sample it here, but also no matter how you take this distribution. The, mat the distribution of the matrix element here is not fixed, it's, it's, uh, you can choose anything up to this normalization. So this is the famous uh, wigner dyson uh, I put it here, so Wigner's observation was that this gap statistics is very robust, depends only on the symmetric class. Symmetric class here is, means that whether it's a complex or real matrices. And this was formulated by this wigner dyson meta conjecture, uh, and it took quite a long time until uh, eventually we managed to prove it. So the statement here is that, that no matter what kind of distribution you put in the, in the matrix elements, the eigenvalue gap distribution is always the same, and it's always given by this curve. Okay, so it's about eigenvalues. So that was Wigner's uh, original idea. But now um, let me go to the, let me extend this Wigner idea back to the, the quantum chaos story. Let me extend it to the, 
to, to, to eigenvectors. Because Wigner's idea was that uh, if you have a complicated Hamiltonian, you can replace it by, an, by, by, by a Wigner matrix, of course, for certain type of questions, for example, a gap distribution is something like that. It's such a question. So now you can ask the same, uh, the similar question about the quantum unicergadicity, because this is also something which was expected for sufficiently chaotic system. So let's try to check it at least for the most chaotic system, which is the Wigner matrix. So that's, the, that's how the, the question came about. And then, and then actually this, uh, because this is such a chaotic system, one expects that also you can have an optimal speed of convergence, which was formulated below by this, uh, the variance being the uh, spacing of the eigenvalues. So this was actually formulated as, uh, by, by Deutsch 30 years ago under the name of eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Um, and we managed to prove it uh, very recently. So here is the precise statement. Uh, Deutsch didn't exactly formulate it that way, but basically that's what, what he says. So the, the statement is the following. Take a Wigner matrix, an n by n Wigner matrix. Here is called W, here I called it H. It's a mistake. I should have used the same letter on the board. Anyway, so you take the, you take the, the, the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the, of the Wigner matrix, UIs. Take an observable. Observable here is a matrix. It's an arbitrary, but the important thing is it has to be a deterministic matrix. There should not be no, should not be correlation between the randomness in the eigenvectors and the A. It's a deterministic matrix. And then you take this, uh, this quadratic forms, U i A U J, and then you want to know what it is. And it turns the statement is that first of all it depends whether i equal j, so the diagonal, uh, so the off diagonals are always z essentially zero, and the diagonals diagonal uh, quadratic forms equal to the normalized trace of the A. This, this bracket here is the, is the normalized trace. Bracket around the matrix is the normalized trace. The bracket here is the usual scalar product. Okay, so that's what that's that's the that's the statement. That's the uh, statement of the of the quantum ergodicity. And here it it, it it holds for everything, for all eigenvalues. So it's, it's really the form of the unique ergodicity. It's, it's, it's not just a few of them, or not just most of them, but for all of them. And then, moreover, you have a speed of convergence. Speed of convergence here, in, 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 it looks, it in, is it in terms of, a, of an estimate in, as, as n goes to infinity. The 1 over square root of n speed of convergence exactly corresponds to the, to the eigenvalue spacing according to the Feingold Perez conjecture. Remember, the Feingold Perez conjecture was that the variance of, of the, the, this quadratic form is proportional with the eigenvalue spacing. The variance of the, of the ui, uj, and if you have such a bound, is the square of the 1 over square root of n, so it's 1 over n. That's exactly the, the, the eigenspacing in this, uh, the, the spacing with the eigenvalues in this normalization. And also we can see the effect, we can see uh, how the a, how the speed of convergence depends on a. Uh, and of course, I mean, it, 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 it's fairly clear that if A, for example, if A is the identity matrix, suppose just imagine that A is the identity, then, then, then there is nothing, there is no fluctuation here because the UI UJ is just the delta IJ, then the UI AUJ has no randomness in it, this is a pathological example. But somehow the, the estimate has to reflect it. And what we found is that the, that the speed of convergence depends on the traceless part of A, the traceless part of A is denoted by this little circle, which is just the A minus its, its normalized trace. Uh, so this is, and, and it comes with the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. So this is exactly the same thing as, the, as it was in this, in this uh, feingold perez conjecture. In that case, it was, it was the, the A, the, the sigma, the, the um, symbol of the A square. Okay, so, so, it's, so this, is what, uh, this is our statement, our theorem. And... Um, you can read it in many different ways. One way to think about it is the following, that you take the, take the, the UIs, these are the UIs are the eigenbasis of your random Hamiltonian, random Wigner matrix, and then you can you have an observable, a deterministic observable, and then you can take the A times UI set of vectors. So you have, you have one set, an orthonormal set of vectors, the UIs, and you have another set of vectors, the A UIs. The A UIs are not orthogon, orthonormal, but Another, sector, other, other set of vectors. And now what this theorem says is that these two set of vectors, and I is not J, these are, these are as, as orthogonal to each other as possible. As orthogonal to each other as much as the two random vectors 
ár, ár or tagon eltűjts. De if you choose two random vectors, so the U, you choose a U, I and the A, U, J, uh, choose two random vectors on the, on the unit sphere, for example, suppose that A has known one, and they are completely random, then typically their scalar product is one over square root of n. That's, that's what happens in, with random vectors. And that's, that's exactly what, what, the, what, what, this, what this, this guy does here. So it tells you that the, the UI and the AUJ behave uh, like, like as random as possible. Okay, so now I would, I would like to explain a little bit about how one proves something like that. Um, and I would like to emphasize that there are two basic methods, and it's not just for that, that theorem, it's, it's many other theorems uh, about random matrices, Wigner random matrices, which have been developed in the last 10 years. Uh, one of them is what, we, what I will refer to as a resolvent method, the other one I refer to as dyson brownian motion method. I will explain a little bit what these things are. The resolvent method is easier to understand. The resolvent is just what is written here. Look at the resolvent of the, of the, of the matrix, H is the, uh, which is the random matrix. You always take a spectral parameter, which is not on the real axis, a little bit away from the real axis, so the resolvent makes sense. But as you all know, the interesting regime is that the imaginary part of Z is very small. If the imaginary part is not zero, but very small, then the resolvent resolves the spectrum in a small neighborhood of the real part of Z in a neighborhood which is comparable with the imaginary part of Z. Okay, so that's always the, the way how you think of the resolvent. You, the resolvent, its it name says, resolves the spectrum on a certain scale, and the scale is the, uh, a certain scale around the energy, which is the real part of the Z, on a scale which is the imaginary part of the Z. Okay, so the resolvent method is able to detect, able, able to focus on, on, the, on the eigenvalues quite precisely. Keep this picture in mind. I would like to understand something, something about the local spectrum. Uh, and that would, that, would be, that would be doable if you understand the resolvent with an imaginary part very close to the real axis. So this is about the, about the resolvent method. And, uh, and then uh, the dyson brownian motion, motion will come later. So now let me just indicate why the what the resolvent method does for you in, uh, if you want to understand this, this kind of overlaps. So usually this UI, AUJ, is also, they are also called overlaps, eigenvector overlaps. And this is, and the relation between resolvents and the quantity that we are interested in is written in this board. That's the most important, it's a triviality, but the most important identity in this talk, if you wish. Uh, what I have here is the, the, I have the observable A, I have, have, it in twi have it twice, and I have two resolvents. Actually, I have the imaginary part of the resolvents, so it will be behave a little bit better, at two different energies, E and D prime, with a little regularization eta uh, in, the, in the imaginary direction. And I want, to have, I want to compute the trace of such things. So it, think of it as GAGA. GA. A's are uh, matrices determines the same deterministic matrix in GR2 resolvent. So now if you write it out in the spectral theorem, you write the G, both the G and the uh, both G's write out as a spectral theorem, then this is the formula what you get. You can easily check it yourself. In particular, the, the, this overlap naturally appears, an overlap square appears in that, and then this is weighted by certain, by, by, by two weights, one of them is in the I, the other one in the J index, which actually come from the spectral resolution of the IMG. The IMG, the spectral, the IMG is like, a, like this Poisson kernel, eta over x squared plus eta squared. Okay, so now you should think of it in the following, uh, this, you should think of this formula in the following way, that, that when eta is small, and that's, that's the important regime, eta is always, you think of very small, then these weights here, these are, these are almost like approxi the approximate delta functions. These are delta functions which focus the index i, or rather the lambda i, to be near the e on a scale eta. So this kind of, so this kind of weight here is like a local average. Local average in the indices. I mean, formally it looks like that the sum is over all index, but no, the, the sum is, I mean, formally it is, but, but because of these weights, actually this, this is a local average on scale, uh, on scale eta. Okay, so, so, so now, so this is, so, so in other words, if you understand some, uh, if you understand the resolvent well, the G well, hopefully you can un you understand not just one G, but you understand this GA, GA type product, 
Well, if you understand this well, then you also understand not necessarily individual eigen, not necessarily individual, over, individual overlaps, but some kind of locally averaged overlaps has the key idea. Okay. So now, uh, so the resolvent methods aims at uh, doing that, uh, computing this side, and then, then going um, using this identity, you can say something about the, the UI UJ. Now, the, the trick in this business is that you cannot overdo it. It looks very nice. You may say, okay, I can, uh, if this formula is true. If I take eta, really it go to zero, then eventually this becomes a delta function that I can identify even single uh, overlap. This is not possible. That's not possible because the resolvent is, 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 is understandable, let me just say it in this way, uh, understandable only if eta is bigger than 1 over n. So the, the resolvent method is something which, is, which, 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 which tells you very good information about the resolvent, but not completely at the imaginary axis. This you cannot expect. You have to have a little bit room. And this little bit room is, <laughs> is exactly that room when the, when the eta is much big, somewhat bigger, doesn't have to be much, much bigger, but somewhat bigger than the local eigenvalue spacing. So in other words, the resolvent methods are not able to understand single eigenvalues or corresponding single eigenvectors, but it's able to understand a, a locally averaged uh, version of that. Okay, so that's that's what the resolvent method does, and the Dyson Brownian motion, this very very high level, circumvents this thing. The Dyson Brownian motion should be is it a tool which allows you to understand individual U I A U J if you know the littlest local average of that. So typically the, the proofs go in two steps. One of them is that you understand the local average using the resolvent method. This, this tells you almost what you want, but not quite. And after that, you, 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 put a, you turn on another machine. Machine, and that's the Dyson Brownian motion, which allows you to, to get single fixed ING on a very high level. OK, so let me go on. And uh, so here, that have been several previous results. Let me not go through them uh, in details. The, the previous results were basically, I mean, our result is now for arbit arbitrary observable. Previous results were first about rank one observable. These are somewhat easier. And then there were also results where the, where the statement was not so, the, the, the sense of the probability was not so strong. Uh, our, our, our result is with very high probability. Very high probability means that uh, the probability that it violates is, violate, is violated is smaller than n to the minus 100. Uh, many earlier results were only in expectation or variance and so on. Um, okay, so let me not go through that. There have been many previous results. And uh, uh, our, our, the, the result that I presented in that way, that result uh, relies only on the resolvent method and it proves the optimal speed of convergence as it was predicted by physics. And we have it very high probability, and we have it also simultaneously for all i and j. And also, as I said, the error term is, is, is optimal. Optimal, not just the one over square root of n is optimal, but also it's optimal in the way how it depends on the, on the observable. Now, so, so far, are, this is, this is what, would, what would call the, the ETH, the eigenstate thermalization statement. Now, these are all low of, low of large number type results. And if you are a probabilist, if you have a low of large, type, large number type of results, you have precise, precise speed of convergence, then your next question is the CRT. What is the fluctuation? Can you identify the corresponding fluctuation? So that would, of course, require that you take this UI, A, UI. Let me just focus on the diagonal case. Subtract what, it, what its low of large number, what its average should be, which is given by the... Uh, by, by the ETH theorem, and then you ask whether it satisfies the central limit theorem. In that sense, the, the central limit theorem would also be a universality statement, like the Wigner-Dyson universality for eigenvalues. Here it will be about eigenvectors. You may say it's a little bit, little bit more boring universality statement, because the Wigner-Dyson statistics, this funny curve, but I'm sure that was a new curve in the universe that nobody has seen that before. The, the, the fact that, this, that these overlaps have a Gaussian fluctuations is not so unexpected. You would say that if you have some sufficient amount of randomness then, and then you see some fluctuating object, most likely it's normal. And that's actually the truth here. But still one has to, 
has to work to prove it. Now, let me emphasize that actually the, the central limit theorem question you can ask in two different ways. Uh, let me first ask, uh, ask in the easier way. So the easier way is the following. You have, so you have this ui a ui minus its expectation. You want to prove a central limit theorem for that. You can do it in two different ways. One possible way is that you think of this object as a random variable labeled by i, and the usual central limit theorem tells you that if you take the, the sum of, of x i's and divide by square root of n, it converges to the Gaussian. So that's, what, that's the first statement. The first statement is that fix an index i0, and then you take a local average of size k, you take um, a few i, few indices near i0, you normalize it by 1 over square root of k, and then you take this quantity, uh, the, 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 this, this overlap minus what it should be. The overlap minus what it should be should, should always be normalized by square root of m. It's also here in this form I put in the end, that is natural size. Okay, so this is one way to ask the question. And here you see that here the, the, there is already this local average. So the i, uh, the, the sum here represents some kind of averaging. It's not exactly that, but because it's a single sum. But it's more or it's some kind of averaging what I have here. It's not asking a question about one single index. It's asking about some averaging thing. So it's not surprising that some statement, like first of all, there's a, there's a statement that this, this local averaging converges to where it should be a normal uh, so there's a central limit theorem, so converges to a normal distribution. But most importantly, this can be done by resolvent methods. It can be done using a, a, some formula, I mean, not exactly that one, but, but understanding the resolvents very well. Actually, it turns out that we have a much more general, which we call general functional central limit theorem, which deals with not just with, with individual eigenvalues, of the, but it also deals with any function of the of the Wigner matrix, but let me not go into that. Yes, the bounded matrix means that the norm is bounded. So um, n is the big parameter, but the matrix is always bounded independently of n, but smaller than. But Sorry. But the norm yeah, the norm appears, yes, because, because you wanted to make sure that, yes, yeah, so actually, I mean, here we even did it more carefully, that, that we, we, we followed how it depends on the norm, yeah. Good. Um, and, now, and sorry, yeah? the, the previous result, can it be obtained as a consequence of this one? Or the previous result? The, the one with the maximum over all i and j. So yeah, you mean this one? Yeah, this yeah. one? It, 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 they, are, they are related, they are not exactly the same because you see this one is a very, this is a high probability statement I didn't oh, okay. emphasize. So this is okay. to, the central limit theorem is, a, is, is always a statement in weak convergence sense. So, mm. so I mean it's always like that. First you prove a, 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 a low of large numbers. Typically the low of large number is true with, with high probability. But then, the, and here it's, it's actually a very high probability. And then when you prove central limit theorem, then this is always expected only in some, some distributional sense. Okay. So, it's, so it's not, a central limit theorem is a more precise, it's a more precise statement, but in terms of control, it's of course a weaker thing. It's, it's, it's always like that. Then. Okay, now, so this was the, so this was the first type of CRT that you can ask. This is the less interesting one. Let me come to the more interesting one. Namely, you can ask for each fixed i, the central limit theorem for each fixed i without averaging. And then in that case, of course, the randomness does not come from the fact that, that you have different i's and maybe these two, two over, overlaps are independent. There's only one overlap, and the randomness has to come from where it is, the, the ui's. The ui's are the eigenvectors of a random Hamiltonian, so the randomness has to come from there. And this is the statement uh, for individual overlaps. So, so you take the, again, the usual thing, you take the, over, the, the over, diagonal overlap minus the average, you normalize it by square root of n, that's its natural size, and you also, also normalize it by this Hilbert, the, 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 the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the traceless part that turns out to be the right thing, that's the variance of this, of, of this thing, and after this normalization, this converges to a standard. Uh, standard um, normal Gaussian random variables. Um, okay, so that's the statement. And the only condition here is that you need some condition, by the way, because you know that if A, I already mentioned before, I mean, if A is the identity matrix, then this is not true. I mean, U, I, A, U, J with the identity matrix even not random. And actually, it's not just that. 
if you take some, if you take some finite rank operator, take the A to be just a rank two operator, I want it to be traceless for simplicity. I don't want to keep on subtracting the trace. So take this operator, which is just just the projection to the x, x side minus the projection to the y side, as simple as possible, traceless operator. Then, of course, this object, what we are looking at, this is just the ui x square minus ui j square, ui y square. So this is the same eigen, the, 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 the value of the same eigenvector at two different locations. And then this is actually not Gaussian. Uh, that, that's known, that has been known before. Uh, the one of these guys, the ui x squared, this is a chi squared distributed. The ui x itself is a complex Gaussian, but when you take the square, absolute value square of that, it's a chi squared distributed, and it also has been proven that for different x and y, these are essentially independent, so this is now becomes a difference of two, chi, two independent chi squared distributed random variables that's certainly not Gaussian. But this is not Gaussian just because it, it, has, a, it, has, fine, it has low rank. But once, once, you, once you exclude this, this trivial counterexample, the low rank situation, and once you make sure that the A has sufficiently big rank, here I put it as finite, not finite rank, but not finite rank really means that, that I mean, this is a precise condition here, that the trace of the A square is, is, is a little bit bigger than the norm. So, so it means that, that the A, A square has, uh, the, the spectrum of the A square is not located only five different, five, five eigenvalues, it, 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 it grows with them a little bit into the data. Okay, so under this condition, the, the statement holds. Under this condition, you have the, the full, uh, full central limit theorem for individual, uh, for individual overlaps. Okay, so that's, the, that's our second statement. And for proving this theorem, the resolvent methods are not enough for the reasons what I mentioned before, because now you really have to really talk about strictly speaking, one of these objects and not, not no averaging behind. Okay, so, and then also has, there have been previous, previous results. Uh, uh, typically, again, the same type of thing that, that if you take some finite rank, uh, finite rank observable, then the statement is not exactly the Gaussian, uh, it's not the central limit theorem in that form, but then, then you get some kind, something like that, uh, that these are, these are independent chi-square distributed, like I said before. So basically, telling uh, this kind of results tell you, if you look at finitely many eigenvectors, let's focus on, say, two eigenvectors, and look at uh, two different entries of these two eigenvectors, the uh, first and the second entries, then this, and the joint statistics of these four numbers can be described, and they are essentially like, the, like independent chi-square distributions. So this has been, uh, this has been known known before uh, with various levels of regularity, uh, with various levels of generality. The, the best result is this marginal yau result, which is sort of the joint Gaussianity, but only with finitely many, um, finitely many eigenvectors and for finite rank operators. Okay, so, um, and then this is our, our result, and there was, a, there was a, a, a related result which was done some, somewhat parallel with ours, with, with Lucas Benimi and Patrick Lopato, which I heard that Lucas will, talk at, will give a talk in this seminar a few weeks later. They also proved this, uh, the similar result, they proved it in a certain regime of, the, for a certain special observable, maybe since then they did, did it more general, which is the, the projection onto a certain, uh, certain, uh, certain bunch of coordinates, uh, of the space, and then it was sort of an, in, in the mesoscopic scale, so it had to be more than order one coordinates, but it had to be less than order n coordinates. So this is some intermediate result. Our result is true for uh, for any observer, for any any rank apart from the finite rank for which the theorem is anyway not true. Okay, uh, let me stop here. Any question about the statement? So there there were two statements. One of them was the ETH statement. These were the the, the overlap. It was a low flash number type statement. The overlap was close to the delta ij times the average trace with an optimal or almost optimal speed of convergence, one over square root of n and so on. This was a, a, this was, this was a statement which holds in very high probability. There's one type of statement. The other type of statement which is still here. It's sort of the, 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 the fluctuation around the previous statement, described very precisely that the fluctuation is a normal fluctuation, Gaussian with, with a Computed, precisely computed variants, so low flash number and CRT type results. Okay. Maybe in 
the last statement. So yeah. what is the range of i, which is the, the index i? So is it? Yeah. No, no, just on, on top, like the Gaussian limit? Yes. The index i is? Yeah, the, the index. So here, for technical reasons, this I think I, I hope I stated precisely. These are, these are uh, we, we did it in the bulk. Okay. So the bulk means that uh, you have the, the, the edges always, always require a bit extra work. Uh, you have the semicircle when the bulk means between minus 2 epsilon and 2 minus epsilon. So the eigenvalue sits here. This is a. Can you maybe show again the statement to repeat it in your Yes. Yeah, it, it, I said it, I didn't say it, but it's with a bulk eigenvector. So bulk, bulk eigenvectors mean... Yeah, but now, that, so you have this convergence of... So is it... So it's a collection of random variables that mm -hmm. you take... So you take, so, so the, for example... It's for fixed i, or...? Yes, yeah, for fixed i, yeah, it's for fixed i, but the i, of course, I mean, i, I should not be there. So, so what, what, for example, uh, the concrete case, you take the i being, being n over 3. For example, this is always the eigenvalue, which the eigenvalues are labeled in the, according to, to, to increasing order. So you take an eigenvalue, you take the n, n thirds eigenvalue. Okay, so and I'm if I take two values like n over 3 and n over 2, can I think of the limit as being independent Gaussian? Uh, that's also true, but this we didn't prove yet. That's oh, also. True, but you didn't yeah, that, that we don't prove yet. So this is this is what we prove. What I say here, that's also correct. What you are saying, that that's also something which 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 will be done at some point. So what you are saying, that the U A and uh, and the U J A U J, uh, suppose that these are this traceless part, that these are essentially independent. That's also correct, but this is not proven yet. So that's that's uh, certainly correct. Okay, so I mean, this is this is um, that, that's also true. That I mean, this is typical. Also, that once you have a central limit type of theorem like that, then you can try to enlarge it to uh, to, to, to to increase it to um, to more general central limit types. And so some joint Gaussianity of several random variables. That there is a statement like that here as well, but it's not proven yet. I guess. Are there other questions? Yes, yes, that's right. It, yes. Yes. I mean, the UI, the, the, the UIs are the eigenvectors, certainly, so um, you can, uh, even not, uh, you can write up the, the usual decomposition of the H, the spectral decomposition, there's a unitary matrix and the diagonal matrix. But, the, but you see the important thing here, this is now, I should emphasize, these are for Wigner matrices. It's not, it's, it's, of course, it's also true for GUE, but it's, the point is that it's true beyond GUE. For the GUE, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, you know that the lambdas and the U's are independent. They, they are decoupled. So you can, that, there you know, maybe I should have said it at the very beginning, if for, for, for Gaussian, for, for GUE matrices, all these things are fairly trivial, because for GUE matrices, the U's are hard distributed. Uh, you, have, you know the pr precise statistics, the complete, complete uh, rotation invariant statistics. And then if you want to compute something like that, you can you want to prove something that for hard distributed use, then you can do it because you can compute the moments. It's not a completely trivial calculation, but it's a calculus called the Weingarten calculus, which, al which allows you to do all moments on the hard unitary and the hard measure. And then, of course, you get the answer. So for, 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 for Gaussian, all these things are, are, are relatively easily doable. But here, the point is that H is an arbitrary matrix in the spirit, in arbitrary distribution, like the Wigner matrix, in the spirit of Wigner's original proof. So I don't want to use the Gaussianity of the, of, of the entries of the H. And this is, you know, this, this may be debatable. Some physicists would say that they don't care. They, they would say that the GUE perfectly models everything. Um, and I think, for, certainly from a mathematical point of view, it's, it's very interesting to go beyond the, the, the GUE, especially because beyond the GUE there is no, there is no explicitly computable formulas. But for example, this example also shows, this, this situation also shows that the GUE is special. 
So the G in the G week is really, you know, the precise distribution of the U, while in our case, in the Wigner matrices, the U is not hard distributed. In some asymptotic sense, it's hard distributed. This is, for example, this is a statement of that type, which tells me that in, in certain, for, for the purpose of certain statistics, taking this, this quadratic form, it behaves as if it were hard distributed, but it's not algebraically hard distributed. Okay, any other? So maybe let me then, then flash up a little bit about the proof. So, um, so I, would, uh, I would like to present a little bit this, this dyson Brownian motion story. Uh, let me not talk about the resolvent so much, but, uh, but maybe the dyson Brownian motion is uh, somewhat more interesting. Uh, so here is the goal. Uh, we, we, it's a moment, we start with a moment method. So I, we identify the Gaussian distribution as always one does, that one computes the high moments and little and moments of that, and it should be what it should be, the, the Gaussian high moments. So we are trying to compute high moments of this, of this thing. And then we do it dynamically. The dynamical proof means the following, that you take, a, you take the original matrix W, sorry, I'm in the, sorry for my writing, the, the, the H is the same as the W and the original matrix. So, so you, take your, you take the original Wigner matrix, this is what you are interested in, whose eigenvalues you are interested in, but you don't do that directly. You, you, you put it into a, a flow, a, a stochastic flow, uh, uh, which is just the flow um, which adds, at the, as a time-dependent flow, which adds a, a Gaussian component to the original matrix W0. So, so in other words, you create a, a stochastic matrix value, stochastic differential equation, it's a fancy name for something very simple, which initial condition is the original matrix, and then you add a Gaussian, you add an increasing Gaussian component to that. So this is the, the first step. And now we will run this whole business only for a very short time. We don't see it for the moment why, but that will happen. We run it only up to a time which is a little bit bigger than 1 over n. So this one, this means that it will add to the original matrix, will add a tiny Gaussian component, only tiny, you even you almost don't see it, but it plays a very important thing. But because it's a tiny Gaussian component later on, so first, so the point is that first we want to prove this, we, we want to prove the result for W, we cannot do it directly. First we will prove the result for the W T when T is a little bit, little bit positive, little bit more than 1 over n. We will prove the result for that, and after that we compare the result, we compare eigenvalue, eigenvectors of the VT with the original eigenvectors, uh, WT with the original eigenvectors W. Uh, the second step is, is a not completely trivial thing, but this, is all, all, this has been fairly well developed. This is a perturbative argument. You can imagine, it's not trivial again, but you can imagine that if I perturb the, the, the W a little bit, but really a little bit, then the eigenvalue, eigenvectors do not, do not get perturbed too much. So this is, this is what, one, this is what, what is do, known under this Green's function comparison theorem. This is again a Green's function method. Let me not talk about it, that's, that, that's another uh, fairly big business. It's more traditional, more, more, more standard to it's a perturbative argument. It's at least it's believable, I think, that if the time is very short, perturb the W with a little bit, then the eigenvalues, eigenvectors do not change too much. Okay, so, so let me focus. So, so now the goal is to, uh, to, to get the, the statement, get some kind of uh, central limit theorem for the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of a, of, a, of a matrix with a tiny Gaussian component after, which is the same thing as after you have run the flow for a little time. And then comes the miracle. So there is a, this is called the dyson brownian motion, which was invented, uh, found out by Dyson, is that if the, if the matrix evolves according to this flow, very simple flow, then the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors evolve according to another uh, system of differential equations, the eigenvectors evolve according to that flow. So here the bi is just, an, for each i there is a bi, an independent Brownian motion, a driving Brownian motion which drives that uh, equation. Plus there, is a, plus there is a interaction term, and the interaction term is this 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. This is like a repulsion term. You know, imagine that you have the eigenvalues, they are moving like that, each of them moves like that according to their own Brownian motion, plus they repel each other with the, with the potential 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. And the sign is important. The sign tells me that they don't like to be next to each other. 
Okay? Now there is a similar formula for the eigenvectors. It's a bit more complicated, um, but, but it's, it's, it also has the same spirit that the, that the, that the denominator, the denomin in the denominator, this lambda i minus lambda j appears. A very important thing uh, to be appreciated that the eigenvectors, eigenvalues have their own uh, system of equations. And I write, I write up one equation, but of course it's i equal 1 to n. So the first set of equations, this is an autonomous equation, it does not depend on the eigenvectors. So you can understand the eigenvalues without understanding the eigenvectors. That's what the first formula says, and that, that's, that was one of the main, this was the main idea behind, one of the main ideas behind when we used Dyson-Brandian motion to prove eigenvalue universality. But now we use the other equation, which is the same thing for equation for eigenvectors, but of course the, eigen, the evolution of the eigenvectors depends on the eigenvectors as well, but it also depends on the eigenvalues in this form. Okay, so these are the equations, and uh, we know these driving Brownian motions are independent. So these are the, the famous Dyson Brownian motions, and, and then proving them is not hard. It's more like that you need the courage to write them up, you know, <laughs> to courage that, okay, you just, it's, a, it's a somewhat hard explicit, but hard work with Ito calculus and so on. Uh, and, and you have to believe that something nice will come out at the end, and indeed it does. Okay, so now what we do is that we want to compute, the, remember, we want to compute the moment. Here I just, for simplicity, I took the second moment of, of, of one thing. And we do the moments in such a way that we always take the conditional expectation uh, with, uh, when you fix the eigenvector, eigenvalue. So the lambda here is both phase lambda means the whole trajectory of the eigenvalues. This you consider fixed. We have quite a lot of information about them. And we want to understand how the UIs, the expectation, how the UI, the statistics of the UIs behave. So, so we take the derivative of the, of the expectation of that. And then you do a little calculation, and you, you, you get some, some formula of that type. So the formula of that type, uh, the way to read it is the following. You want to understand the quadratic form of, a, of an overlap. Uh, the derivative of that becomes, become, it involves quadratic forms of other overlaps. Here you see i, i, and then here you k, i, and then i, j, I think. My eyes are not so good. Uh, and then, then divided by this lambda k minus lambda j, this come from the denominators from the dyson brownian motion. And there are many other terms. It, so this is the structure. Uh, most importantly, if, even if you just want to understand the diagonal overlaps, uh, in the very first step you have to deal with off-diagonal overlaps as well. So, so it, it looks like that you don't have a closed system of equations. So, sorry, uh, last look. Mm -hmm. The d is, is a one over d over dt, or the yeah, the there's, first there, that's right, yeah, there's a dt. There is a dt. Yeah, yeah, there's a dt. Or, or, or rather, the, or maybe I should have put the d over dt on that side, yes. Okay. Right. And, and lambda is really the whole, t it's not just the, the initial condition. No, no, lambda is, lambda is, is whole, lambda t. It's the, it the also whole, depends on the whole t. Thing, yes. it's the, 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 so, because this, this whole trajectory, the whole lambda t trajectory, I consider fixed. And everything is conditioned on that. So, we are working in the measure. We are working in the, in the probability space of the use conditioned on the lambda. That's that. Yeah. Yeah. On the last formula, on the right, use i and let's use u. Uh, ui u equal. Ui this is ah, uj, yes, this maybe. is ui. No, I think this is it's ui. Uh, ui no, you can put uh, it outside. It's, you sure it's the same? Yes, I think it's UI or yeah, it, UJ? It, it's a term which is which is contracting. It, it's something which you can pull out from the okay. Yeah. Okay, so so now this equation it's a it's an ordinary differential yes, equation. Yes, it's an ordinary differential equation, but it's a, of course it's a system of ordinary differential equations, and as I said, the diagonal term it's it's not like that. The diagonals depend only on the diagonal; the off diagonals appear as well. I mean that's the formula. Okay. Now you can you can try to work. You can try to continue. You can try to write up equations for the off-diagonal ones. It's getting more and more messier. Uh, but then there is a good news, and this was a, an important observation. Uh, there is a special combination of diagonal and off-diagonal overlaps. And here is the, I wrote up the simple second-order one, which comes up in the variance, which is you take twice the off-diagonal for fixed i and j index. It, you you define this quantity f t i j. Take the off diagonal index twice plus the product of the two diagonal indices. This is a special combination. If you take that 
and then you plug, uh, plug it back into the into the, the, the original equation then you get something which is which looks somewhat nicer in a sense that it, it depends so at least it's autonomous the, the, the FTIJ it has two indices it depends sort of on itself Although again on the other side you also see uh, F, uh, F, F, T, F, uh, with this two indexed object. So, so there's a closed equation. I mean, this is a little bit miracle that it, I mean, because here there are more ad, many other terms. If you take the right combination, all these terms is when the whole thing boils down to something. Is it something what like Bourget and Yahoo yes. did? Okay. Yeah, so this is, this will come here. So this is this, this is a basic construction of Bourget and Yahoo in. Uh, that actually there is a, so this was the, the example for the, the, the two case, but there is, a, there is a closed equation for every order. This was a second order situation. There is a closed equation for every order, so every order, uh, there is an analogous expression, complicated, symmetrized um, object of all possible permutations of the indices, but there is a quantity for which you have a closed equation of that form. And here I wrote the equation in a very simplistic way. The, F, uh, the derivative of Ft, is some operator, which is time dependent, times ft, it's a linear operator. And uh, so here's one, one, one example of that, the, 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 the easiest one when n equal to, but it works for any order. And now the, the idea is the following, the idea is what was written here in red. That's the, that's the main point here. So first of all, you should think of this operator L, just look at it, how it looks like. The L is an op is like a Laplacian. It's a little bit like a Laplacian. It has the, uh, so this, this should be thought of as a heat equation. The right hand, left hand side is, of course, the first order derivative. The right hand side is like a Laplacian. This L has the property that you, you want to evaluate it at i and j. Okay? Now what you do is that you fix one of the indices, the fix the j index, and you move the i from, to, uh, from i to k. So you take the you jump to the neighbor from i to jump to the k, and then you subtract if, if you did not jump, you subtract the original i and j element. And then this, this jump has a rate, and the rate is proportional to the one over lambda k minus lambda i square. So, so this is like a, this is like a generator, depending on your background. I, I can view it as a heat equation, I can view it as a Markovian generator. Um, but it has this property, it has this balancing property that, that you, you, you jump to the neighbor. Okay, now, so the, the, the point, is, uh, point is this one, this, this red part, is that, that what we have to prove is that, that this equation, it really behaves like a heat equation in the following sense. The heat equation has the property that it equilibrates. Equilibration here means that it has an L1 to L infinity uh, bound, it has a decay in L1, L infinity, if, if, you, if you start with a profile, just think about the usual heat equation, which may have a big jump, a big bump, uh, in L infinity is, is uncontrolled, but in L1 it's controlled, and after a little time, this big bump is pushed down. That's what the heat, heat flow is doing. So you get, an, you get a bound uh, for, which goes from L1 to L infinity. You can estimate the L infinity norm at a bit later time in terms of the L1 norm at the beginning. So, so this, this is a basic, basic idea of, uh, of the heat equations, and this equation has this property. It has this contraction L1, L infinity property. And why, why is it good for you? It's good for you because once, because you are interested in this, understanding this FKJ type things, I mean, for example, this, this, this overlaps, uh, FIJ type things. But then if somebody tells you Somebody tells us Fij quantity does not depend too strongly on the i and j indices. So if you knew some kind of, some kind of local, local constantness of this quantity, if you know that the Fij is the same as the Fi prime j prime, uh, if you know something like that, that the Fij is the, roughly the same as Fi prime j, if i minus j is small, um, not too big, small. If you know that, then, then, so, so then, then that would mean that the profile is somewhat smooth. So that would mean that to understand this one, it's enough to understand its local average because it's the same. So then you are back to, you are back to this thing. So once you, once you know that, the, that, this, that this quantity in the, in the index i and also in the index j is, is somewhat smooth, somewhat regular, then you, can, then, then you can go back to the, to the resolvent methods. You can, you, can, you can replace the FIJ, by, the, uh, FIJ by, the, by its local average, and then you are in, in business. 
it's very important here the expectation. You see, this, this statement that I said, that the FIJ is, 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 is more or less flat, this statement is, can be true only for the expectation. It cannot be true without the expectation. This UI, AUG, they are, they are truly fluctuating things. And, uh, and, and if you change the I, then you get a different fluctuation. This, uh, this, uh, this, um, the UI, J, UI, AUJ, with the right M square, no, square root of M normalization, is a genuine complex, a genuine fluctuation random variable. You cannot expect that for I and I prime is the same. But its expectation is the same or close to each other. That's why we are looking at the expectation of this thing. And for that one, you can hope something like that. Okay, so this is the this is a basic idea, and I don't have I don't have basic I don't have any more time, so I don't want to maybe let me just flash up one or two pictures. But but if you understand, but, but, uh, this was sort of the important message here, and then and then one has to build up, one has to understand what this dynamics is really doing. So this is some kind of uh, some kind of jump dynamics as I already uh, described before. So you have indices, I, 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 J, K, and so on indices. Uh, sometimes you have, you have more than one indices, so for example, this ui auj square, this is a quantity in which involves the i index twice, and the j index also twice, so you, 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 you devise a particle picture, you, 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 you encode uh, such an object by, by particles, the, part, the location of the particles corresponding to the indices, and then you think of it as a, as a, as a dynamics on, on, on jumping, on particles jumping on the on the, on, on the integer numbers. Let me not go into the details because it's a, it's a fairly complicated thing, but, the, but eventually what, the, what, this, what this operator L, the Laplacian is doing, it can be described by jumping particles and the jump rate is given by this one over lambda minus, minus lambda. So now the, the, the point is the following, maybe the last thing that I want to emphasize, so that, that after you, you have this particle picture, you have to understand what this, what this 1 over lambda k minus lambda i uh, jump rate is doing. Now imagine that the lambdas, uh, the lambdas are random themselves, but, but, on, a, on, a, uh, but on, a, on a on a on a little bit mesoscopic scale, we know, also we know it from resolvent methods, we know that the lambdas are more or less uniformly distributed. So uh, each of them fluctuate a little bit on a scale 1 over m, but if you look at on a little bit larger scale, then every lambda is roughly where it should be. So that means that this 1 over lambda minus lambda, roughly the, the rate is roughly speaking the 1 over the difference square of the indices, of the corresponding indices. And then you have to recognize what this is. So if you have an operator, a jump operator whose, whose kernel, jump kernel is 1 over i minus j square, then, then, then you should ring a bell, because this is nothing else than the discretization of the square root of the Laplacian. The, 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 the square root of the Laplacian in one dimension, it's a dynamics on one dimension, square root of the Laplacian in one dimension is given by the kernel 1 over x, y minus, x minus y square. And this is exactly its discretization. So this is uh, so effectively, what you should think of this is uh, that this is a discrete, it's, a, it's a discrete version of a heat equation with a fractional Laplacian, the, the square root of the Laplacian, and that puts you in, the, in sort of the right business to, to, to have an idea how, how well this L1 to L infinity decay, L decay is behaving. So these are sort of the, the very, basic, very basic main ideas along the proof. Uh, heat kernel estimates uh, identifying the heat kernel with the, di with the, with the uh, fractional Laplacian and so on. So let me not, let me not go, uh, go into more things. The only thing that I, maybe I should mention at the end, uh, I, I, I didn't want to say anything about the resolvent method, but let me just indicate, let me just indicate where this condition comes from. This was at the beginning saying that the resolvent method is valid only for eta, bigger, much bigger than one over n. This comes from, from something which is called a local law. The local law is a law of large number for the resolvent, and it says the following. It is the simplest form. I take only one resolvent. At the end of the day, I have to take many more resolvent. But let's talk about one single resolvent, G. I want to understand its, its average trace of the single resolvent. And the, what we call the local law says that this average trace is equal, it, 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 it's given by a deterministic quantity, which we always call M. M is an explicit function, it's given by that, it's, it's the CTS transform of the, of the, of the semicircle law, it's a very well-known explicit function, so it's given by that, plus an error term, so this is a random object, M is, M is deterministic, 
plus an error term which has a size 1 over m times image a part of z. This error term is stochastic, this is a random error term, and this is its exact size. I mean, if I put it here as an, o, as a, as an estimate, as a big O of 1 over m in, in, zeta, in, in z, but one can actually prove that the fluctuation of this g minus the m, or the fluctuation of g, variance of g, is exactly of that order. So that shows, not very surprising, that shows that once the imaginary part of z, which is called here eta, eta, that the n times the eta is bigger than 1, then this 1 over n imaginary part of z is small, goes to 0, compared to the, the leading term, which is an order 1 object. If it's not like that, then actually the fluctuation wins. So that means that once the eta is smaller than this 1 over n, then you cannot think about the resolvent as becoming deterministic. And then all these, all these, all these, determ all these resolvent methods fail. So that's, that's the reason why, why, why you have this distinction, that when eta is bigger than 1 over n, much bigger than 1 over n, then, then results of that type will work with increasing difficulty. You have to prove them, but once it's smaller than that, then they fail, but then you have to go to this other idea, a very different idea of the dyson Brownian motion using equilibration of heat gather and so on. Okay, so let me just come to the conclusion. Uh, there are many, many slides which are prepared, but of course I don't have time. So um, anyway, but I, I think I told you the, the essential thing. So this is what we proved. Let me just recapitulate. So we proved the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis for Wigner matrices or the quantum unicard galicity is the same thing with optimal speed of convergence uh, and, and for, for, opt, for any observable. Uh, and then second, we proved the Gaussian fluctuation of this, of this, of this eigenvector overlaps. Uh, but only for one of them, as Marini said, I mean, there are many things to be done, so in particular one can also just prove that this is Gaussian, one can start asking the question, what is the, uh, what, what happens, what is the joint distribution of two different, of different objects like that. And then the main technical steps, I mean, these are, these are more, uh, more technical, which I really couldn't, couldn't enter into that, but, but there is a multi, there is a, um, uh, a dyson Brownian motion, this is multi-index dyson Brownian motion, which I sort of very vaguely presented, and behind that there is an energy method. So this is a basic partial differential equation method. In some sense, from PD point of view, is the easiest. You do an, you do lots of energy estimates before you actually can do the L1 L infinity bound. Uh, I didn't have time to explain that. And then we we have to use the this, we have to do this local law here. I just presented a very simple local law, but actually we have to do the local law for this GA, GA, the 2G local law, under the condition that A is, A is a special observable, A is a traceless observable, so this requires lots of improvements. And then, and then at, the end of the day, in, 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 at the end of the day, in order to prove that, uh, it turns out that when we prove local laws of this, not just for 1G, but for GA, G, and so on, this longer chains of products of Gs and As, then, then one cannot do it just one by one, one has to do it at the same time for all of them, roughly speaking. So we actually we have a, even though we are just interested in what we call the 2G local laws, so objects like that, in order to prove that actually we have to prove local laws for all of them. So basically we have a statement which tells you what is the leading term of any of the, any of chain, any chains of the form that G, A, G, A, G, A, and so on. Somehow it comes as, as a package. And this is, and we have what we call master inequalities, which, which are a system of, of differential equation about the sizes of, of longer and longer chains, and they are coupled to each other, and eventually we can close it, so, so we can use some kind of Gromval argument to, to estimate it. Okay, so I think that's, that's it. Thanks for the attention.